Hey people, spring is in the air, and I just got this old CL Benley out of uh, storage, and it's pretty dirty. It's in need of some new tires, which I picked up. So, if you want to stick around, I'm going to throw these new knobbies on this beast, and uh, clean it up a little bit. I'm going to need to clean up this little gorilla also. This thing is uh, a great little unit, but it's awful dirty at the moment. This is kind of a regulation ride that uh, I do some deliveries on, and that's a, a little cub that I built from pieces of different cubs. And that's a Yamaha YB1 two-stroke and uh, Vespa. This is a, a vintage Honda Tact, about a 1982 as far as I can tell, that I put um, some Suzuki crash bars on and a few other things. But anyway, here's our task at hand again. This is the Honda and uh, just give you a before look because I'm gonna detail this thing today. I think uh, Not you know, I'm not gonna get carried away. But we're gonna get the mud off. And we're gonna get those tires put on it But it's pretty dirty Give you a little look at the life here in Japan. We've got uh, garbage day. There's our little garbage truck coming around picking up our stuff. And uh, anyway, back to the task at hand. So here's my little stand, and this is how it works. When I work on my little gorilla over there, or work on uh, my girlfriend's little tack, that little green one, the jack stand works perfect at this height. And then when I work on these bikes, this is the ideal height. So we'll uh, just move this over for a second. Is that kind of where we want it? And there it is. It's pretty sturdy. We'll move it in just a little bit. Beauty really of working on these little bikes, you can manhandle them. Okay, before we get going with the tire change, I'll just show you my little kit here. Certainly better systems in the world, but I found this in the garbage, essentially. I screwed some feet on this side from an old amplifier I had. And then in this box, I just keep uh, spare tubes, and uh, this is my tire change kit with uh, and patch kit. We'll look at that later. There's a little Honda tool kit and uh, a couple other wrenches and uh, valve stem tool. So at this thing also, uh, you'll see in a minute, doubles as my bike jack. So let's get this thing up on the jack. Okay, let's get this thing pulled off. We've got uh, a 19 millimeter on this side and 14 millimeter over here. These are really unique setups. I don't know if... if I, you know, I grew up working on uh, dirt bikes and uh, CBs and things like that. So <clears throat> the first time I worked on a Cub style, I was really surprised as to how they work. And uh, I think you will be too if you've never worked on one. So let's get this off and we'll show you how it, how it goes. Uh, we got to take this uh, brake shoe off here. Break the lever, I should say. I got better work gloves if you're wondering, but uh, found these for 99 cents. And uh, they're, I'm a Green Bay Packer fan, so they kind of remind me of the Packers. So we gotta tilt the bike just a little bit in order to get this break out one drawback of my whole system here. Okay, just let that hang. We'll throw this back on. It took me about 50 years to learn to just do things like this. You know, 
put it back together so you're not looking for pieces later. Okay, I think this is a 13 millimeter if I remember right. Okay, back to what's unique about these bikes is that you can just remove uh, the wheel right from the back of the bike and there's these little rubber grommets that uh, actually this one's looking a little worn but these connect in here so your sprocket and your chain everything stays on the bike and uh, it's just the easiest thing to disassemble and to change on the side of the road especially. Find yourself an old log. The tools that come in your kit are enough to fix a, a flat tire, but the, you know you need to pump of some kind. So I've got a hand pump under my seat, a little bike pump. So I can fix a flat on the side of the road. A tube issue, of course, you know, not a, uh, not a blown out sidewall or something. But. Okay, I think I'm going to take this inside and do it uh, in the comfort of a, of a carpeted room instead of out here on the street. So, let's bring her inside. But before we go, I'm going to give you a close-up look at this for anybody that's not familiar with a, a cub style. I mean, it's such an ingenious, simple, um, you know, way of doing things. I've, I've really come to appreciate that. All right, let's go in and get this tire changed. Okay, things are all good. While I was over getting some cardboard to lay down on my rug in there, this Universal arrived, and that's the next one. Uh, this is my girlfriend's cub, but uh, I'm going to throw that Universal on. Probably not today. I'm going to get enough tire change in for one day. Uh, I want to show you one thing really quick here. This is a Rikuo tank which is a really interesting uh, tank and a story. But this is essentially a 1920s Harley Davidson tank and in the early 30s Rikuo, a Japanese company, bought all the old Harley presses and uh, had a license agreement to produce Harleys off that old press in Japan. So this is was manufactured in uh, Japan, but off of the Harley presses from Milwaukee, and it's all in SAE or standard, where everything in Japan is in metric. And uh, just an awesome old tank. I found that in the woods. I'll, I'll tell you that story. Okay, let's get started on this beast. I threw on some knee pads, which are not uh, necessary, but the older I get, the more I appreciate them. Uh, let's take a look at this toolkit, first of all. So, what's in here is uh, a patch kit and a couple of pry bars. This old hammer that has a pry bar end on it, which I really like. Uh, another scuff kit. A couple different, um, you know, valve pullers. But just in case you don't have a valve tool, which most of my childhood I didn't, I was trying to um, get in there with needle nose pliers and anything you know you could find. But if you can get a paper clip and bend it up so they're about the same uh, width, and then I try to do this without getting my head in there. Uh, you know, obviously it's a lot easier with the tool, but if you don't have one, you got to really hold these two sides of the paper clip tight. And it takes a little effort. But it can be done. Once you break it, then it's pretty easy to get it moving, but... Let's get those a little bit straighter. Everybody that has a tool just fast forwards. <laughs> the 
is kind of nonsensical at this point, but uh, again, I'm not going to give up till it's out. But the point here is if you're on the side of the road, you can uh, get it done without a tool. Don't let your uh, Schrader valve go flying all over the place. Okay, so there it is though, we got it out. And um, now, uh, let's put some of this stuff away so we don't lose it. And next thing, uh, we're just gonna kind of work our way around here and push this bead off both sides. Now a smart man would remove his tube right now so we don't damage the tube, but uh, I'm not that bright. So I'm gonna try to do it without taking the tube out. You wanna get underneath here and uh, be careful not to pinch your tube though. And uh, take that little curved end. This is for the ultimate beginner if, if you're watching. You're gonna need at least three of these, but I found it. Uh, more than three is better, but three is minimum. So once you get here, you can take the middle one out, move down a little ways, keep going. And I like having a few different sizes because sometimes a smaller one is better and so on. Okay, so once you get to a certain point, you can hopefully be able to start just pulling it right off the rim like we did here. Now, here's where we're in danger of uh, wrecking our, our tube, but if we just pull the tube out of the way, and then we can get in way deep underneath here, and we're going to do kind of the same thing, but you got to get on the inside of that bead, you know, from the back side here. I might be a little aggressive with my pull there. All right, we gotta move a little closer. There we go. Okay, so back to that uh, recoil tank. All right, we got it. So back to that recoil tank, I do some metal detecting here in Japan and uh, I found a spot on Google Earth that looked kind of remote. It was remote and on Google Maps and it was just this big forested area. But in the middle of it was a little kind of a speck. It looked like a ruin or something. And uh, I thought, well, you know, at minimum, so much has happened. I live in, I don't know if I've even mentioned this, but I live in Nagoya, Japan. I think I just did, but. Um, and in Japan, there's so much history over here. So anywhere you go, somebody has been before and it's possibly dropped something. So I kind of like looking to see what's out there. So anyway, I saw this spot on Google Earth and it looked like some ruins in the middle of a forest. So I thought, well, let's check it out. So I started uh, walking around and metal detecting and found that spot, which was a piece of concrete, which is really strange because there's again, nothing out here whatsoever, but there was like a, an old foundation from a pretty good sized building. And it looked like it had been industrial at some point. Well then, I'm wandering around and uh, there, here's this little rusty old shed. And the shed was, uh, while I'm talking, I'm just gonna investigate my rim because I haven't seen it in a while. Uh, looking pretty good, a little bit of rust on it. So, there was this old shed and uh, I kind of peeked inside there and I'm like, oh, wow, look at this old shed. And there was mainly junk, some old paint cans and a few odds and ends. And, um, you know, part of me wants to clean this up a little bit and, and paint this with some rust inhibited paint, but I think that's a project for next year. All right. So anyway, uh, I'm like, oh, a bunch of paint cans and some garbage. Well, I grabbed something out of there, an old light or something. I mean, it's, I don't feel bad about this. It's in the middle of nowhere and uh, nobody's been in the shed forever and it's falling down. And so, um, you know what? I think I'm gonna pull this tube just so I don't wreck it. And uh, so I 
I grabbed that light and a couple things, and that was it. I left. And then about eight months later, uh, me and a friend were driving around together, and I said, hey, there's a there's an old shed off the road up here a ways. You want to check it out? There's a, there's a couple other things, like an old pump and a couple things laying around outside. Yeah, that sounds good. So we rode over there, and uh, I showed, we walked through the woods a little bit. We couldn't find it at first, and finally I found the shed, and I'm like, oh, here it is. And uh, he's like, yeah, that's cool. I mean, it wasn't that cool. There's not, not much to look at, you know. Uh, like I said, a couple paint cans and um, some wooden crates and some junk. So all of a sudden, and it's dark in there. All of a sudden, I kind of stumbled over something. And I'm like, what the heck? And I point my uh, light down, and I see the side of that tank. It was in halves, you know, two pieces. I'm like, holy crap. And... I looked right next to it is the other side. I'd missed it. There was some wood that was over the top of it. I missed it the last time I was there. And I couldn't believe my eyes, you know. It's this Rikuo tank. Now, if you want to make your life a lot easier, get this soapy wet. And you'd be able to push this on a lot simpler. But um, we're going to just go ahead and fight through it. So, that's the story of the Rikuo tank. I just uh, couldn't believe my eyes me on the way home stopped at like a Denny's style family restaurant ish kind of place and uh, I brought the tank right inside the restaurant with us because I was so excited about it all right so now this is just the reverse all right we're gonna get underneath here and force that baby over I am kind of disappointed that I'm not cleaning up that rim. Okay, we did too good a job. We got both sides in one one move there, which we don't want because I gotta get the tube back in there. I really should have just left the tube in there. Okay, so now let's feed the tube back in. And we got to find our valve stem hole, which is right here. And you want to be careful that you don't, uh, you know, get a fold in this tube anywhere. You're probably seeing the back of my head primarily. All right, we're back in. And I'm just going to put this on a little bit. We don't have to tighten it down right now. All right, and then just feed your tube around. And again, making sure you don't twist it or get it bound up on anything. If you're, you know, kind of a... You know, if you're on a big adventure bike, none of this is going to matter. You can't do a lot of this stuff on those types of bikes anyway. But if you're on a little bike, uh, I've got a pretty good patch kit that I carry with me all the time, and I've had to use it. But before you use it, and once you assemble it, I recommend uh, just kind of going through the motions. If, if you're planning on a big trip and you don't, you know, you're not going to be around anybody, just try it once and see if you can patch a tube on your own with just the tools that you brought with you and uh, it's a good way to feel a lot more confident about your your trip I've got a few buddies that have little bikes like these and we can take them all over Japan and camp in them and not in them but you know with them all right again here we want to be really careful not to pinch our tube That little bike I'm changing the tire on, I, I drove it about 500 miles to a Fuji Rock Fest a couple years ago. See Bob Dylan, Jack Johnson, a few, quite a few people, but uh, my primary purpose was to go see Bob. I love Bob Dylan. Okay, that's it. Now, uh, if you've got your hand pump, you know, put your Schrader valve back in. And uh, I'm not going to use the paper clip this time. I'm not sure if this is a necessity. 
but I always lick my valves before I put them in. Makes me feel better anyway. And we'll just tighten that up. And we're done. I'm gonna go grab a air compressor and we'll pump it up. Okay, what I got here is just uh, an extra a portable pump from the Porsche out there. And uh, that's not how it comes apart. Oof. This has been broken for a while. I had it glued, but it obviously isn't going to hold. I'll take care of that a little bit better. So in the meantime, we're just going to set her up. And this is a little sketchy, but I brought this back from the States when I was back last time. I had it in my garage over there. So it's designed for 120 volts, but Japan runs on 100 volts. So I don't think we're getting quite as much uh, voltage as we normally would. All right, she probably needs more air than that, but uh, I think I'll just ride her down to my gas station and top it off. Ooh, definitely needs more air. Okay, but that's it. One down, three to go. And, uh, you know, putting it back on is just the reverse. I'm going to clean everything up before I put it on. Okay, after all that metal detecting talk, I thought I'd show you a couple finds here. And I've got a big uh, chest of drawers dedicated to things upstairs. But uh, this just happens to be down here. I used to keep this in this little, still do, in this little coin purse. Uh, I taught corporate English classes. And, uh, you know, just to break up the, the day, I would discuss this at some point. Uh, and over the course of our six week uh, class classes and uh, anyway uh, so that's why it's in that little container but here's a few things I found over here uh, this is pretty interesting it's an old uh, just an old round but it's not a center fire rim you know the typically our primers are in the center and this is an old end fire rim cartridge so these were, fell out of favor pretty quickly so it's a uh, kind of a rare old cartridge uh, this, I always get excited when I find these because uh, what this is, is uh, well, let me just say that I get excited because I, I hope to find the other half, and uh, most of the time I do, and it's it's kind of fun to see how far apart they are. Any guesses as to what this is? Keep in mind, there's a second half to this, all right? But uh, what this is, is a, an old Japanese tobacco pipe. So this is the mouthpiece, and then there was a piece of bamboo here, you know, typically about this long, somewhere around here, about like this. And then there was a, another bowl end over here. So whenever I found the bowl or the mouthpiece, I would get excited and start looking around like, where's the other half, you know? Because the bamboo would, would uh, you know, disintegrate over time, and these pieces in the hundreds, 200 years that they were laying there, they would you know through rain and whatever else find themselves a few meters apart so anyway i just uh typically would find both but in this instance i just found this one uh and sometimes you know somebody lost a tip somebody lost a bowl so you know that's just the way it is uh this is uh it's not really a kane tsuho but it's similar to that uh i forget what this is because it has these uh little markings on the back it's a little bit of a different coin but this is uh 17th century uh, coin that was up in the mountains, you know, so it's really exciting when you find they're not they don't have a lot of value But when you find something like this, it's kind of exciting uh, Here we've got a couple of musket balls and this is a little game ball little hunting ball here that clearly missed its mark or uh, uh, Was dropped this one uh, clearly hit something, you know, either hit a tree and uh, um laid there in the forest forever um, until I came upon it. But this is uh, more of a, a big game or a soldier's round. Uh, these are, uh, I, I didn't clean this on purpose. You know, this is this is dirty. This is kind of how they look when they come out of the ground. But uh, this is a late 1800s coin. And this has been cleaned up a little bit. And it's the same coin, but a smaller version of it. So uh, the dragon is the same on both coins here. Whoops, sorry, we're a little out of focus. But uh, that's 
a kind of a dragon curled around there. But uh, pretty cool. And I found all kinds of things, you know, 50 caliber rounds and um, some silver, hammered silver pieces from the 16th century, uh, 17th century, and um, scale weights and tons of pipes and musket balls and things like that. So uh, anyway, uh, let's get back to the bike. This video is uh, a hodgepodge. We're getting all kinds of crap. But uh, I make my living over here in Japan restoring and selling vintage music equipment. And uh, while well, I was getting ready to put this tire back on, this delivery just arrived. So let's, if you're interested at all, let's see what's inside of here. If you're not, feel free to fast forward. Two packs like this. It's one thing to use newspaper, but you got to use the world's smallest little pieces of newspaper. Look at this. Oh my god. That's a heavy beast. Okay, what are we looking at? Something pretty awesome. This is an Evans Vocal Echo 200. And what it is is an old vintage Japanese PA system uh, that you can you know, run a bunch of mics or guitars through. And then on the top is a vintage tape echo machine, which uh, will give you an echo effect by using this tape. I mean, how cool is that? If that interests you at all, I've got a million videos about tape echoes up on my main channel, Vintage Audio Nagoya. So, all right, anyway, enough with that. Let's get uh, this bike back together. Okay, let's get this baby back together. And I'd like to clean this up a little bit, but, you know, it's going to get dirty again right away. I'll clean it up when I wash it, but, you know, a, a major detail clean could be in order. Uh, just one more time, I didn't really show this that well, I don't think, but... Here are those little rubber pieces and they just are, you know, they insert in here and again these are getting to the point where they could be replaced. Uh, they start to get a little bit hard. But the beauty of these is, again, you can disassemble this thing so easily but it provides a little bit of uh, shock support there so you, um, you know, the, the bike is a little bit more comfortable to ride. Before you put your wheel back on, make sure your bead, you see this little line around here there's like a little bit of a line in the tire. Make sure that's the same gap all the way around. Because um, sometimes the tire can get caught, pinched a little bit. Or, you know, just make sure it's looking pretty good. And we're looking pretty good. So, let's, uh, let's throw this back on. And when you're in here, you might as well inspect your shoes. And, uh... We're looking good. Um, I'm a little disappointed because I normally would grease this. Why don't I? I'm going to grease it. I'll, I'll feel better about myself. I'll be right back. Alright, it's probably overkill, uh, but it just, uh, in my mind, it's good to do. So what I'm going to do here, you can see there's a little bit of rust built up. I mean, very, you know, minuscule amount. But when you pull the brake lever, you know, you're spreading out your brakes and that's what uh, applies your, your braking force. So we're just going to take a little bit of silicone and uh, not much, but put it right here. We don't want to get in our shoes, so we don't want that much in there, but a little bit uh, and I'll spread it around here. But that just helps your shoes operate a little bit smoother and uh, hopefully doesn't, it'll stop that rust a little bit. All right, so, all right, I feel a lot better. Now we gotta take our pin back out and take our bolt, our nut and washer back off. This takes a little bit of, you know, 
working it around to get it in there. Okay, we're in. And then, remember we had this, this little uh, spacer. So we're going to take... do that after you bring it down that'll make it that'll make that a lot easier Okay, that's basically it. We're going to tighten this down. Now we're just going to adjust this brake back to where we think it's the best. We'll fine tune that once we get it out on the street. Okay, people, we did it. We got one down. I'll do the fronts and uh, take this beast out for a rip. These are typically 50 cc's. This is a 125 engine put in here. And uh, there's a lot of racks on it. You might be wondering, why does it get so many racks? But I do a lot of camping and, like I said, metal detecting. and So uh, those racks come in handy. I store this thing outside in this little... Uh, addition to this abandoned house, not abandoned, but empty house over here. So that's why it's so dirty and dusty. All right, we'll detail it up and we got another year of ripping. Okay, we're not going to go through the whole process with the front wheel, but if I just shift the bike backwards a little bit, uh, it allows the front wheel to come off the ground. And then, uh, you know, I can, it just sits here in this position and uh, allows me to pull the front off. Okay, to get the front off, you just unhook the front brake and undo the speedometer cable. And then you can do the same here, inspect this. I'm gonna grease it. I'm gonna, uh, like I said, I'm not gonna show this because you kind of got the idea, but I'm gonna bring this in and swap this tire up and we're ready to rip. Awesome. Thanks for coming along, people. Uh, if you're into old music equipment, check out Vintage Audio Nagoya. It's, you know, it's under my same name. But uh, I might do a couple more bike videos. I got a lot of maintenance to do on the, on the stuff in there. So we might, uh, might do some videos on there if you want to check them out. And I, I might take you along on some camping trips this summer, too. We'll see what happens. Take care. All right, people. 
tires are on and she's dialed in. Got a good wax on her, pretty clean. Could be a little bit more, you know, 